Coming up on Dialogue Weekend, the DPRK files missile tests after the U.S. redeploys a carrier group near the Korean Peninsula. What brought on the recent tensions, and how is the U.S. playing a role? The 51st session of the U.N. Human Rights Council concludes in Geneva after a month of talks. What issues were discussed, and what progress has been made? Now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to this edition of Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qinduo. The U.S. and South Korea have launched a new round of naval drills with a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier and other warships. A day after the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, or DPRK, testified missiles and flew warplanes. Tensions have been escalating since a U.S. aircraft car carrier group moved into nearby waters for joint military drills, the first time in many years. What brought on this rise in tensions? Is there a potential for the situation to be further destabilized? To help us understand the current situation on the Korean Peninsula, I'm joined by Victor Gao Jikai, Chair Professor at Sudo University, Anna Tangen, Current Affairs Commentator, and Sun Yung Lee, uh, Kim Koo Korea Foundation Professor of Korea Studies at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. Welcome to the discussion. Victor, I will start with you here. You see this the latest round of tensions in the Korean Peninsula. So uh, where, where it started, you know, what kind of action uh, has brought uh, the current tension, let's say? Well, first of all, the rising tension on the Korean Peninsula is of great concern to uh, China and several other countries uh, in this vicinity. And the real reason why the tension is rising is because of the large scale military exercises by the United States and uh, the Republic of Korea involving, shockingly, the air aircraft carrier group. And uh, uh, this is not only of great concern to the neighboring countries, but to DPRK in particular. Because if you look at the size of the economies between DPRK on the one hand and the United States on the other hand, and ROK on the other hand, uh, there is no comparison. DPRK is so small and so insignificant as an economy. And so, so why should the United States you know, go to such a length as to do such an unprecedented large-scale military exercises, not only on the land, but also in the air and in the sea, involving aircraft carrier battle group? And I think they should have anticipated the consequences. And while uh, the uh, firing of the missiles by DPRK need to be analyzed separately, I think we all should condemn the large-scale military exercise by the United States and ROK. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Lee, here, uh, you know, of course, if you see um, Western countries mostly blame South North Korea for firing missiles, uh, you know, missile testing. At the same time, North Korea has expressed a concern, saying that, uh, you know, rigging strike group, the redeployment here nearby waters, that's a threat to their security. It's a nuclear powered and also they call it a rehearsal of a invasion. Uh, there's a legitimate concern on the North Korean side too, right? Sure, but every action and reaction has a cause. And when you look at the past several months, let's say just January from January this year on, how many times has North Korea violated blatantly several UN Security Council resolutions, nine or 10, that explicitly ban North Korea from developing and testing ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons. So North Korea, I've lost count now, has conducted on more than 25 occasions this year alone ballistic missile tests, and 15 of them was before the new South Korean administration uh, came into office in May. So the resumption of joint live defensive military exercises by the U.S. and South Korea for the first time in nearly five years is displeasing to North Korea, but it's a resumption of military exercises that had been going on for decades in response to North Korea's escalation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if you look at the nature of this escalation, obviously the confrontation, the hostilities between DPRK or North Korea versus you know, South Korea and the U.S. plus Japan. It has been, I mean, long during. It has been there for a long time. So what's the nature of this issue you know, to those people who are, say, not following 
the escalation? What's, what's the real nature? What's the real concern on both sides? All right. <clears throat> From uh, the North uh, DPRK side, I mean, it's very simple. Well, uh, they still do not have a uh, peace treaty. Uh, this is still a state of war. You have, you know, going back to the Korean War, that's never been settled. Uh, they want assurances that they will be uh, allowed to continue uh, with their own country. And that needs some sort of security guarantee. They would like that from the United States. Um, they would also have to conclude a peace treaty with uh, South Korea. That was on the brink. Uh, Donald Trump said he could bring it home. It was a complete flub. He didn't do anything. Uh, and now you have a situation where it's once again back to provocation. There are no good actors in this particular play. Uh, you cannot say that North Korea is blameless, as uh, my colleague from New York has said, and you cannot uh, say that uh, uh, the U.S. is blameless, as Victor said. So at this juncture, you know, the question is, why is the U.S. going back to the same playbook if it's not working? It can, continues to put pressure on and, you know, push and confrontation, military, uh, you know, gunboat diplomacy. And it, it, it didn't work well in Ukraine. It's not working well with uh, China and Taiwan. It's certainly not working well with uh, the the North Korea. So at this juncture, you know, I, I do would put more blame on the United States. Uh, the DPRK is going to continue to try to get attention. Uh, the U.S. needs to deal with it instead of looking at domestic politics all the time. Uh, Biden has to step up and be the kind of statesman that the United States and the world needs instead of thinking about what the midterms are going to bring. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Lee, uh, since 2019, the talks between North Korea and the U.S. have stalled. Uh, are we seeing there's a consistency in terms of the U.S. policy on North Korea or lack of consistency because of the change of uh, uh, government in Washington? Well, no, the U.S. position, as far as I can tell, um, since Biden took office, has been that the U.S. is open to unconditional talks, whereas North Korea has not responded. And when we view North Korea as small and backward and um, unconventional as North Korea is, compared to the big, more prosperous nations in the neighborhood, major nations of the world, we tend to patronize North Korea. We tend to underestimate North Korea and assume that this paranoid player merely reacts to external stimuli, what the big powers say or do. I think in the main, North Korea, to the contrary, has been the driver. In the past three decades of nuclear talks between North Korea and the United States involving others in the region, including China, South Korea, and so on, I think North Korea has called the shots. North Korea has said, let's talk what the agenda is. North Korea has set the tone and decided when to walk away. So what happened in 2019, yes, Trump and Kim Jong-un did not uh, reach a deal in Vietnam in February, and since May of that year, North Korea has resumed frequent ballistic missile tests. So North Korea is reluctant to talk right now. And I think North Korea is setting itself up for better, stronger leverage when Kim Jong-un decides to return to talks. And how does Kim Jong-un do that? Cause problems, export insecurity. That's the North Korean metier. Uh, well, Anna, if you look at the, uh, I believe it's the 2019, you know, talks in uh, Vietnam, uh, right before that talks, uh, you know, the John Bolton, uh, National Security Advisor, talked about, uh, you know, Libya-style uh, solution to the North Korean nuclear uh, issue. I mean, that's a bad result. I mean, no government will, <laughs> will accept, uh, you know, if you put your foot in the, in, in, you know, in the shoe of North Korea, for example. That means like, a, the, you know, the collapse of the government. The government will be overthrown. Uh, so, I mean, it's not a surprise, right? Uh, there's a lack of agreement, probably. Well, there's a lack of trust, uh, and that's not just with the DPRK. I mean, th this goes uh, around the world. The U.S. has not been a consistent player. If you want trust, you have to lead by example. Uh, you know, walking away from treaties, whether the JCPOA in Iran or the, uh, you know, Kyoto, uh, the Paris Climate Accord, uh, threatening NATO at the time, and having very inconsistent policies.
from administration to administration. This is not the way to do it. So when you have John Bolton on the sidelines yelling and screaming, yeah, we'll, we'll take away his teeth and then we'll, you know, we'll kill him. Uh, this isn't really uh, going to be uh, very helpful. Um, yeah, North Korea does not trust the United States. I, I don't know if there's any big game plan. Uh, the idea is that they want to keep their nukes and they also want some sort of economic relief. I don't think that this is going to be something that they can arrange. Um, I think right now the U.S. is actually playing this card against China. Uh, this is in China's backyard. This is, involves South Korea, Japan. It's destabilizing the region. And, you know, the U.S. seems to like that idea. Uh, well, Victor, uh, you know, uh, a few uh, Western nations uh, have proposed, uh, like, uh, called for UN Security Council, uh, like, urging the meeting to condemn North Korea, the DPRK. Uh, but then, you know, the Chinese ambassador uh, said that, you know, UN Security Council should not uh, fuel tensions and should play a constructive role rather than just exerting pressure. And uh, he stressed that, like, dialogue is the only way to achieve peace on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, what do you make, it, uh, make of that in the dialogue? Should we resume dialogue? And what conditions we need to resume the dialogue? I agree with the Chinese ambassador of the United Nations. Uh, I would say if the United States want to raise all the havoc on the Korean Peninsula, havoc will happen to the uh, Korean Peninsula. And people in DPRK as well as in ROK will suffer the consequences, as well as people in neighboring countries. If the United States really wants to in, enter into negotiation and uh, diplomacy with DPRK together with ROK and China and Japan and uh, uh, Russia, for example, uh, going back to the old six-party talk framework, then I hope relations on the DPRK and uh, between DPRK and the ROK will be easier and more stability will descend onto the Korean Peninsula. This is the only right way going forward. I don't think pressure by the United States on DPRK will succeed because the government in DPRK will toughen up against such pressure by the United States and they will never surrender to such pressure by the United States. Therefore, this is high time to enter into negotiation and dialogue rather than really just lecturing or putting more pressure onto DPRK, it will backfire. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, picking up on what you have said about the U.S. policy in this region, for example, there's AUKUS, uh, the U.S., the U.K., and Australia, uh, basically uh, to transfer the nuclear technology to help North, uh, uh, Australia to produce nuclear submarines. And of course, regional countries are concerned with that, about uh, you know, the spread of the nuclear technologies uh, well, probably not as serious as, uh, as say, the nuclear weapons development uh, in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but equally, uh, that's, that's troublesome for this region. Well, it is. And I mean, this, it, it's going to take more than just dialogue. It's going to take uh, demonstrated action. So I, I agree, dialogue is the beginning, but you have to have small, verifiable steps on both sides. And it has to go through one, more than one U.S. administration. The only alternative is to have others who are trustful, uh, China, uh, other countries, maybe ASEAN, um, uh, Japan, Korea, South Korea, and have some sort of basis upon which they can act. But if the U.S. is going to continue to try to stir the pot uh, to you know, uh, send nuclear carriers there, it's not going to work out very well. So at this juncture, um, Trust is the major issue, and until that is restored, there is really no hope of uh, going down. I, I, you know, the international order that the U.S. says that they always want to protect and promote is based on trust, that you will sign a treaty and you will abide by it. But the, you know, the United States is the uh, biggest um, you know, violator of, of these agreements, so it's, 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 not, it's not looking good at this juncture. Uh, Professor Lee, uh, lastly and briefly, uh, are we going to see the situation to be further uh, destabilized in this region? I believe so, because North Korea, I believe, is, is on that trajectory of escalation, graduated escalation from short range to medium range to long range missiles and perhaps a nuclear test as well. We're living in a different world in this 
2022 in this year because Putin and Kim Jong-un and his sister Kim Yo-jong have normalized, routinized the threat of nuclear strike. Well, uh, let's leave it there for now and shift our attention signal. to Geneva, where uh, the Human Rights Council has voted against a China-targeted draft decision. For this part, we are also joined by Dr. Saeed Mahmoud Ali, Associate Fellow at the Institute of China Studies, University of Malaya. Welcome to the show, Professor Ali. Uh, so a few Western countries, you know, including the U.S., uh, presented a draft proposal at the Council to hold a special debate over the human rights situation in China's Xinjiang region, uh, but it was voted down by 19 against 17. So China's ambassador Chen Xu said the, the, the push to discuss the issue was taking advantage of the UN to interfere in China's internal affairs. What do you make of this latest move by some Western countries, obviously led by the US, over human rights issue here? Well, the record shows that China's critics have found human rights useful as an instrument of leverage against China for many years. It cannot be asserted that all such allegations are entirely baseless, far from it, but the political motives are significant. For many years, Tibet was the focus of contention. In more recent years, as we have seen, Hong Kong has provided powerful munition to China's rivals. And now, especially since two successive U.S. administrations have used the appellation of genocide to events in Xinjiang, that is where leverage seems to lie today. And that explains what's been happening in Geneva. Uh, well, Anna, uh, as Ali said, that yes, uh, you know, the U.S. Uh, actually is from the U.S. Uh, to uh, uh, Secretary of State, you know, um, Blinken and previously uh, another uh, Secretary of State started this so-called genocide accusation against China. And then there is a false labor, uh, the spread of such false information. Um, to say the least, uh, to tarnish the image of China. And uh, of course, with the report produced by the UN Human Rights Council. And then uh, it seems there's a, uh, you know, a, an attempt to highlight or to put China on the spot uh, with Xinjiang. Uh, so now with the result, it says a lot probably, you know, if you uh, take a look at the support China enjoys in particular from developing countries here. Yeah, I mean, if you start going back over the UN voting record um, over the, since the 2000 period, uh, China's rise, there has been a marked change. The Global South and the stands are no longer voting with the United States. Um, they are going more and more independently. It's not that they're going to, towards China, but they're less inclined to be dictated to. So in this particular case, um, you know, this was the only resolution that failed. And there were 11 abstentions in addition to the 17 yes and 19 no's. Uh, and there was a real feeling among um, the, di the diplomats that this was, you know, the UN was being used at, uh, just put pressure on China and that this is an uh, issue that is, uh, you know, unique to the United States trying to push this. Uh, uh, they didn't uh, get into where all of this propaganda is coming from in terms of the U.S., uh, the Jamestown Foundation or Adrian Zenz, etc. But they did feel that this was a misuse of the United Nations, which is supposed to solve problems as opposed to trying to point fingers on behalf of countries that uh, have an axe to grind. Mm -hmm. Well, Victor, we know that, uh, of course, in the U.S. is uh, uh, launching this, uh, let's say, the policy of containment, you know, uh, against China's uh, continuous development, uh, you know, with the, the concern that China one day will replace the U.S. as the number one country, you know, the global preeminence uh, somehow will be enjoyed by China. Uh, so the U.S. basically is using everything it has against China. And then there's, a, from the Chinese side, there's a concern that the U.S. is using the Xinjiang issue, for example, to target the Chinese economic development, uh, you know, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, say, solar industry or, or Xinjiang uh, cotton, for example. Uh, it's, it's, it's more than tarnishing China's image here. Well, first of all, I think uh, the United States uh, gets two things completely wrong and combined together in a very toxic way. They worry that China will continue to grow and eventually grow larger than the U.S. economy. 
And then they also worry that once China is larger than the United States as an economy, China will replace the United States as the top dog in the world. From the Chinese perspective, China, yes, will continue to grow. And in uh, less than 10 years before the end of this decade, the Chinese economy will be larger than the United States if we use official exchange rate as the benchmark. Even though China is already much larger than the United States in a whole range of categories, for example, production of iron, steel, cement, concrete, you name it. Uh, however, from the Chinese perspective, there is no desire or interest or will to replace the United States as the top dog in the world. Why? Because China does not see any fun of becoming the top dog. China wants to treat all the countries in the world, big or small, as an equal, rather than, for example, imposing its own will onto the rest of the world. Therefore, if the United States really wants to combine these two completely different things together, then they are mistaken. They need to wake up. And if they want to stop China's economic rise, for example, they will fail, fail miserably. Now, as far as Xinjiang is concerned, Xinjiang's record speaks for itself. I think people in Xinjiang today feel much safer than before, and the radicalization spillover from Afghanistan has been very much contained and economic development of Xinjiang will really take off sometime in 2023. So the world will have another look at Xinjiang and we'll see that China has the right recipe for dealing with fundamentalism and radicalization in calming down the situation in Xinjiang and making sure everyone in Xinjiang is free from radicalization, terrorism, and uh, fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Ali here, uh, you know, many people would say uh, this is more than Xinjiang. Uh, I think you more or less touched upon that. Uh, you know, if you look at the U.S. Uh, policy against China, it is, as you said, you know, human rights has been an issue between China and the U.S., but never probably uh, their, uh, say, differences or confrontation has reached such a level. Um, you know, the U.S. is using not only Xinjiang, but also Hong Kong. Uh, the latest example would be probably Taiwan, you know, Nancy Pelosi's provocative visit. And then the U.S. sent, you know, uh, one group after another. Uh, their Congress people to, uh, to Taiwan to, you know, sell more weapons to Taiwan, basically against China, against the rights of China. So that's a big game. Well, um, I find context uh, is quite helpful towards understanding this U.S.-China divergence and also divergence between the U.S.-led coalition uh, against China on the one hand and other countries which either abstained or voted against the resolution in Geneva today. Uh, let me give you a couple of points. First is, uh, since 23rd April 1992, some years going back now, the USA, via its fiscal year 1994-1999 defense planning guidance, effectively proclaimed itself the systemic primate at the core of a unipolar systemic structure once the Soviet Union collapsed, or world leader as the phrase has been used more openly and often. In August 1999, the US government identified China as an emerging, quote, constant competitor, unquote, in the Office of Net Assessment's annual summer study titled Asia 2025. And in late 2017, as we all remember, the US officially designated China as the principal source of threats to US unipolar primacy, um, a structure also described as the rules-based order. Against that backdrop, any source of perceived leverage against China would be useful and welcome. But outside of the US-led coalition, this view does not appear to have gained significant popularity yet. And that's what we saw in Geneva as well. Mm -hmm. well Anna here, you know, uh, the Chinese ambassador to the uh, Human Rights Council in Geneva said that the draft decision is not pro-human rights, but for political man manipulation. And he told the council that today China is targeted, tomorrow any other developing country could be targeted. Uh, probably there is a reason, you know, basically around 100 developing countries have uh, voiced their support for the Chinese position. Well, yes, and I mean, there, there is this, as I said, there's a lack of trust that exists. The UN was supposed to be the means by which you could build trust, uh, not only between countries, but in an in a, in a international system. Uh, 
uh, but you don't see that anymore. It's increasingly being used by large parties to push issues that they think are there to, to their advantage. Um, I think the professor gave an excellent uh, expose of exactly how the U.S. has been moving to uh, you know, isolate uh, China, the designated as a bad actor. And this is, this is uh, there's, the problem with it is there's no strategy. I, I, going back to something Victor said, I think really what the U.S. fears is that a uh, China that's on top would act the way the U.S. has acted in the past. The U.S. has not been at peace since uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. It's been involved in 66 regime change clandestine operations, six open uh, regime change uh, operations. And, you know, th th this is since 1945. So, you know, th this, you know, there is this concern that, well, what would China do if it was on top? And I think this motivates a lot of people. They say, well, we have to stay on top. Otherwise, who knows what will happen? Mm -hmm. but, uh, and uh, here is also an issue of like technically is a double standard. You know that's uh, the criticism from many developing countries. Uh, I mean, if you remember the International Criminal Court, uh, prosecutor uh, proceeded to investigate war crimes of U.S. soldiers and the CIA, and the U.S. threatened to impose sanctions on her and her family, basically. Uh, and finally, uh, the International Criminal Court abandoned the case. Uh, abandon the efforts to do the necessary investigation. But then the U.S. basically has been frequently pointing finger at other countries for on the human rights issue or whatever issue, but there's a lack of attention on the U.S. human rights record. Are we seeing, I mean, serious double standard issue here? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you start looking at what, what's happening, uh, the divisiveness within the political system, the, what's happening to young African-American males that we see you know, with our own eyes on, uh, from the video, uh, the attacks on uh, minorities, uh, voter suppression, uh, the rise of white nationalism. I mean, the, these are all things, I mean, you, you can't just ignore, but I think there, there is a kind of standard plan uh, it's very much like the Trump. When somebody accuses you of something, you just make something up and accuse them of it. So if I'm doing something bad, I'll just accuse you and everyone I, I don't like of doing exactly the same thing. You'll be busy defending yourself as opposed to looking at the actual facts within the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, what is surprising is that the U.S. was not uh, you know, given more uh, heat at the U.N. Uh, over its record. Uh, there was mention of it. Uh, there are there's issues about it. But, you know, as you said, the United States has a double standard when it comes to prosecuting others. The ICC is fine. But when it comes to the United States, they do not recognize the authority of this group. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of a double standard, the Professor Ali has, uh, you know, produced, I would say, like a, a cynicism, you know, um, among a lot of countries, you know, uh, people are becoming cynical in terms of like, uh, OK, the Ukraine war. Uh, the West uh, uh, has expressed disappointment in you know, other countries, in particular the, develop the global South, is not uh, 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 you know, joining them to impose sanctions on Russia. But then people would point out the U.S. You know, invasion of Iraq without any uh, provocation, without any U.N. Auth authorization. Well, <laughs> once again, the context is useful, I think, for me. Uh, instead of going uh, sort of very deep drilling into into the situation that you refer to. I, I, it's fair to say that we exist in a systemic structure which moved from a deep frozen bipolarity where Soviet Union or Russia was deeply involved to unipolarity after the Soviet collapse and is now again shifting. But nobody can predict with confidence what the final shape of the dynamic global security architecture will be. In the midst of the systemic transitional fluidity, I think the current or outgoing Primate is trying to defend its primacy in all practical ways possible, short of actual and direct combat with its two principal detractors. Demonization of presumed rivals appears to be a part of that process. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think it's fair to say that China could also improve the defense and explanation of its own policies yes. and actions okay, to the we world. Have to stop there, but Professor. That's the issue. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also find us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Xinduo. Thanks for being with us. See you next time. <laughs>